Hey guys, welcome to your second web-based lecture of the semester. Um, today we're going to be talking about limb three of our eight limbs, asana. Um, I will explain in a second why we are starting with limb three. Uh, just to give you guys an overview, we're going to do a really quick and dirty review of last week's information. Um, I do want to touch on why asana is so important. Um, I think so much of yoga in the Western mind becomes attached to asana and the postures. Um, and we're very familiar with child's pose and downward facing dog um, that we actually forget there's a lot of other practices that go with the total practice of yoga. Um, so looking at asana from that perspective is actually critically important, I think. Um, and then today what we're going to do is we're going to really focus on the different categories of asana. Um, each different pose can fall into a certain category and each category has its own sort of lists of benefits that go with it. So I want to talk about those today. And then per usual, we will end with our last homework. So again, really sort of quick and dirty review from where we were last week. The pyramid on the left of your screen that is the representation of the eight limbs of Raja or Ashtanga Yoga. Um, get really comfortable with this pyramid. You're going to see it a lot this semester. Um, I, again, I just think it's the clearest and easiest way to sort of illustrate how all of these limbs are sort of integrated and how they work together. So just a reminder, your bottom two limbs, the red and the orange bars, the yamas are our social restraints. The, uh, the niyamas are our sort of personal observances. Um, we are going to talk about those next week. This week, we are concentrating on the two green bars. Um, asana, which are the postures, which is today's lecture. And pranayama, which is your breath control, which is the other lecture that you guys will have for this week. These represent hatha yoga or the, that physical path. The reason that we're doing this out of order is because we are starting with asana and pranayama in class this week. We're not wasting any time. So because the physical portion of yoga is most important to what we're doing in class, um, that's why we're doing the limbs a little bit out of order. Um, so again, we will do asana and pranayama this week. Next week, we'll take a step back and talk about those uh, social restraints and personal observances. And then in the future, we will focus on the blue and the purple. Those are our four higher order thinking limbs. Um, and I will always sort of refer to them as the higher order thinking limbs in sort of a group that way. So why asana? Whoops. There we go. Asana, again, are those physical postures. The physical postures are designed to strengthen um, to stretch or to rejuvenate the physical body in some way. That's critically important, not just for those benefits, the strengthening, the stretching, the rejuvenation in and of itself, but because that plays a key role in how your self, capital S, perceives the other eight limbs of yoga. Okay, so again, in Raja Ashtanga Yoga, the purpose of asana is to actually prepare that self for your increased amount of mental, emotional, and spiritual energy that are particularly brought on by the practices of those higher order thinking limbs. Um, what we really mainly want to do, first and foremost, we want to release any physical blockages that the body has. Um, physical blockages can manifest themselves in a number of different ways. The example that I have on the slide is tight hips. You'll hear me refer to that a lot. We are a culture and a society, we sit a lot. And because of that, we have lost a lot of flexibility and mobility in our hip region that we are meant to have. And by doing some of the yoga postures, particularly something like cobbler's pose, we are actually bringing that flexibility and mobility back to our hips but it's also critically important because we don't want there to be pain or other outside um, factors that we're focused on physically 
when we're attempting those higher order thinking limbs. So allowing our body to release that physical energy, that need to fidget, that need to sense pain by doing the asanas allows the physical self to quiet down so that your emotional and spiritual and your mental self can sort of dial up in the higher order thinking limbs. We also use asana to release mental blockages though. And the mental blockages are just as important to release. Um, the two big ones are non-competitiveness and selective attention. I will say to you guys over and over and over this semester, the non-competitiveness is really, really a key in yoga. Just as much as you're not supposed to be competitive with your neighbor, you know, all of us are going to find somebody who we can look at and be like, wow, that person is way more flexible than I am. Why can't I do that? Um, but just as important is to not be competitive within yourself, to recognize the fact that our abilities change from day to day based on a myriad of different factors, and that's okay. Um, to just be able to recognize that and then let go will serve you very well once we get to the meditation aspect of the semester. Um, and the other factor, the selective attention. Um, again, in our Western culture, we tend to be very sort of frenetic about what we focus on. Um, and to give you guys an example, how many of you have ever unlocked your phone because somebody texted you and instead of checking the text that you got, you end up checking Facebook and then Instagram, and then your email, and then eight other things. And then you remember that somebody texted you, and by the time you get to that text, you've got three other people talking to you as well. Um, and that's what I mean by selective attention, focusing on what you need to focus on and blocking everything else out. Um, practicing those physical postures actually allows us to practice that. We get to practice, how do I feel in this pose, in this position? Why do I feel that way? Is it good? Is it bad? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, and again, those are all things that are going to be very important as we get into talking about meditation later in the term. So that brings me to the categories of asana. There are eight different categories that I want you guys to know. And before you worry and fret about having to memorize every single one of them, what I'm going to do is give you a really quick way to help yourself. Most of the categories are based on how your spine lines up. Okay? So the easiest way, if you're having trouble figuring out, based on a picture, which category a certain asana falls into. The easiest thing I can tell you to do, draw a stick figure representation of that posture and that should give you a clear indication of what is your spine looking like what is your spine doing in this posture and that will help you categorize things so with that said our first category are standing poses in a standing pose your spine remains in an unbroken stack above your base of support now, it's a standing pose, so it should make pretty good sense to you guys that your base of support are going to be your feet. Um, standing poses, while some of them are very simple and straightforward, are actually really, really engaging. Um, they call on many, many muscle groups at once, especially small muscle groups, um, especially in your lower legs and your feet. Because of this, they're very dynamic poses, and they are able to enhance strength, flexibility, and alignment. So again, even though some of the standing poses are quite simple in what they look like, they're actually quite challenging to the body. Um, a very good example that I can give you, the top picture on this slide is mountain pose. And everyone looks at mountain pose and they're like, oh, that's easy. But to hold mountain pose for several breath cycles is actually very challenging, um, as you guys will hopefully be seeing in class this week. Um, the picture on the bottom of the slide is eagle pose, which is a more advanced pose, um, but it's nothing crazy. So we'll just certainly be able to get to that and, you know, experience that this term as well. Okay. Second category, forward folds. In a forward fold, your spine is going to curve forward to allow your torso to fold over your legs. Okay. 
Forward folds are really great for stretching the back side of the body, for stretching um, your upper torso, your lower back, and your hamstrings along the back side of your thighs. Uh, forward folds also work to tone your internal organs because in general you're sort of squishing and compressing your midsection. Uh, your organs sort of have to squish and compress and move around each other as well. So it's really great for toning the smooth muscle that lines all of our organs, lines our stomach, our pancreas, our lungs, all of those sorts of things. Um, because you're folded forward, forward folds are generally considered to be calming poses. You will very often see them after challenging poses. Um, what they allow your body to do is sort of rest and reset itself. Um, in particular, you will see child's pose, which is the bottom picture on this slide, as a restful pose that will allow pranayama, your breath cycles and your breath pattern, to return to normal after a very challenging series. Um, the top picture on this slide is standing forward fold. Um, again, a very common pose um, and something that we will be experiencing. Third category of asana, back bends. A back bend is exactly the opposite of a forward fold. So in a back bend, your spine actually arches backwards. Should make perfect sense. Um, again, back bend is an opposite. So a back bend is going to stretch the front side of the body, stretch your chest, your abdominals, and your quadriceps on the front side of the thighs, um, and strengthen your back muscles. Back bends are critically important because they're stretching the front side of the body and they're causing a lot of opening to occur there. That facilitates breath pattern. It allows your lungs to open very, very wide, so it allows a lot of air in and a lot of air out. Um, and that's excellent for the body. It's very energizing. Um, it allows you to uh, sort of release any tension that you're holding in different places. It also allows you to release um, toxins, in particular carbon dioxide. You can really exhale a lot of that through back bends. Um, the two pictures on the slide, at the top we have camel, which is a very, very simple and straightforward back bend. This, the picture is the traditional pose. Um, camel is also very easily modifiable, so that's a back bend that I will use with you guys quite a lot. And the bottom picture is bow pose. Um, bow pose is a little bit more advanced. We will get to it this semester, but um, it creates a lot of interesting sensations in the body because it is a little bit more advanced. Um, and I do really want you guys to sort of experience how your body feels in that posture. Fourth category of asana, side bending poses. In a side bending pose, your spine bends laterally, meaning it bends to the left or to the right at the level of your hips. So that's really key in this pose. You're not bending up at your shoulders. You're not bending in the middle of your torso. You're actually bending at your hips to the left or to the right. Side bending posers are going to stretch muscles on the opposite side of the bend and strengthen muscles on the same side. So if you are bent towards your right, the muscles on the right side of your body will be contracting, which means they will be getting strengthened and stronger. The muscles on the left side of your body will be elongated, so they will be uh, receiving the stretch. Um, side bending poses are really critical in creating good posture um, because you have to do side bending poses twice, once to each side of the body. Um, it's really critical in sort of helping with any muscle imbalances that you have. Most of us tend to have a strong side and a weak side, um, especially if you're right-handed. Right-handers tend to be very right-hand dominant um, and much, much stronger on the right side of their body versus the left and side bending poses are really helpful in sort of evening things out a little bit. Um, so these help really create good posture. They're also firming poses. Again, you've got a lot of strengthening and stretching, stretching happening, so it really firms a lot of your body. Um, pictures on the slide, triangle at the top. Um, again, a very straightforward side bending pose that I'll use a lot. Um, the bottom pose is half moon. Again, definitely a more challenging one. We will attempt it. 
I will give you guys fair warning, most of you will have trouble with the balance in Half Moon. There's nothing wrong with that. It is a much harder pose than what it looks like. Fifth category of Asana. Fifth category of Asana are twisting poses. And here we are getting to rotation in the spine. Um, in our first four postures, the spine never actually twisted. Um, the spine actually stayed facing square. Um, in side bending, obviously, you bent laterally. Um, but here, we're now talking about actually rotating. The easiest way I can give you guys to remember what the difference is, take a look at the two pictures on the slide. You will notice that shoulders and hips are not square. So what I mean is you're looking at the front side of shoulders, for instance, but the side of hips, okay? And that's always how you can tell a twisted posture, is if when you look at somebody straight on, you see either the front of their shoulders and the side of their hips or vice versa. You see the front of their hips and the side of their shoulders. Um, so again, in a twisting pose, your spine is gonna rotate left or right. Twisting poses are tension relievers. Um, they relieve tension, especially in your deep back muscles. Think to a really long day on campus or a really long lecture that you've just sat through. What's the first thing that you do when you start to fidget in your seat? You usually twist. Why? Because your lower back is a little stiff, a little tight, and you want to relieve that tension there. That is the purpose of these postures. Um, it promotes proper spine alignment and as you guys could hopefully sort of intuit thinking about my example from sitting in class, these are refreshing poses. They make you feel better. <clears throat> the top picture is the revolved abdominal twist and the bottom picture is seated twist. Um, both of these we will do um, because they're relatively easy and relatively safe. Sixth category of asana. Inversions. Inversions are easy because it is any pose where your head is lower than the heart. Okay, regardless of spine position, regardless of everything else, if the head is lower than the heart, it is automatically an inversion. Okay, inversions reverse blood flow in the body. Typically, when we're upright, gravity works um, to pull our blood from our heart down to our feet. Well, when you're inverted and your head is below your heart, gravity is still going to work, but now blood is going to go up towards your noggin. This is really beneficial for your hormone control system. Um, your hormone control system in your body lives in, you have one center in your brain and one center in your thyroid gland, which is um, at the base of your neck. So it's very critically important that those two areas get uh, very good blood flow to help regulate your hormones. Inversions are generally also partially supported by your upper body. So, you know, these are postures that are going to strengthen your upper body as well. Um, and these are rejuvenating poses. When you come out of them, you should feel good. Um, not necessarily calm, but sort of a relaxed energy, I guess, if that makes sense. Pictures on the slide. At the top is downward facing dog. Um, at the bottom is easy inversion. Um, easy inversion is exactly like it sounds easy and straightforward. Downward facing dog everyone thinks is easy based on the pictures, but downward facing dog is probably one of the more challenging asanas that most of you guys will go through this semester. Seventh category, seated poses. Seated poses are typically used to modify other postures by allowing for a larger base or increased stability. Um, if you think back to our discussion in class last week about dimensionality and base of support, this should make sense to you. Okay, The bigger your base of support, the more stable you are. Um, we also use seated postures to enhance hip opening postures. So with both of those, two great examples on the slide. The top picture is seated forward fold. If you think back to our forward folding slide, this is the exact same body position, dimensionality, as standing forward fold. The difference here is that we're modifying it for support. So rather than have our feet be the base of support as they are in standing forward fold, now you're seated, so your bottom and the back sides of your legs are your base of support. 
same pose, same benefits, much more stable. The bottom picture is cobbler's pose. Um, I mentioned this at the top in reference to tight hips. This is a hip opening posture. Um, <clears throat> lion's face pose is the common way to do this from a standing sort of position and it is quite awkward if you don't have great hip flexibility. Um, most people are familiar with cobbler's pose, uh, especially if you're an athlete, you've done this as a stretch before. Um, but again, it's very, very worthwhile, and this is certainly a more straightforward way of accomplishing the same goal as the lion's face pose. Last category. I know everybody's excited. Last category of asana are our resting poses. Um, there are only two of them, essentially. Uh, one is prone on your tummy. One is supine or on your back. The resting poses, it's important to note that even though you have a very large base of support in these poses, you should still be maintaining muscle control. So when we reach uh, Shavasana at the end of each of our workouts, whether you choose to be in corpse or choose Shavasana position, which is the top picture on this slide, or whether you choose to go for crocodile and be on your tummy, you should still have enough muscle control that you're not just laying flopped out on your mat on the floor, okay? Um, again, either of these two poses is fine with me. I usually recommend for beginners, try them both and see if you like one better than the other. Some people have one pose that they can just sort of relax more deeply into and so they're more comfortable in that position and that's fine. Um, but again, either of these are okay with me, so try them both and see what works. All right. Our, la our second homework, um, and again, going with our lecture, what I want you to do is please find an asana not mentioned as one of the examples in this lecture, so something that I didn't already show you a picture of. I would like you to submit in the submission box the name of the asana. I want you to tell me what category does it fall under. Please don't use Wikipedia or outside sources. I've given you all the information that you need in this lecture, so please use the lecture information to identify it. Don't forget if you're having trouble, draw your little stick figure. Why did you choose the category you did? Give me the anatomy basis for it. Tell me, what is your spine doing? If it's an inversion, point out the head is lower than the heart, all of those sorts of things. And then I want you to tell me what benefits you might expect from practicing this asana, okay? Again, the submission box is up and ready to go. It's due by noon on Friday.